are well known. The faces very familiar. The excitement is up next. ESPN and the Professional Bowlers Association bring you the championship round finals of the Greater Detroit Open. Welcome everyone to Taylor Lane in Taylor, Michigan. Hi everybody, Mike Durbin here one more time and working with me as always, PBA and ABC Hall of Famer Earl Anthony. Earl, we've got a great cast of five players tonight, but the two guys at the top, they're both PBA Hall of Famers. They are, and they are tremendous talent. There's no question about it. Brian Boss, the tournament leader, has demonstrated in the past that he can win from the number one position, and this guy has not won in a long time in this country, but he is a winner over the last eight years at least one time. Uh, the guy in second place, David Ozil, another outstanding talent, and if these guys meet for the championship, we're in for a real treat because they're both great shot makers and they're both really uh, fundamentally solid bowlers and pretty to watch bowler too no but question. the guy in the number three spot it's already won twice this year he's got an outside chance for player of the year no question about it jeff stayruck the left-hander only one in the top 24 obviously the only one in the top five this guy could, again he's a great shot maker can play any of the shots that are necessary to be a good left-hander on the left side he's a great athlete he trains well works hard and he is ready to win today because like you say he could still be player of the year. He's got his third win. And in our opening match, we've got a real treat for you, too. A former PBA president, Mark McDowell, taking on last year's U.S. Open champion, Justin Roman. <laughs> and there you see the handshake. We're using lanes 39 and 40 here at Taylor Lanes in Taylor, Michigan. Justin Romick, one of the young lions on the tour, is up first. condition it's very basic as you watch uh, mark mcdowell get ready and get set here it's very basic it's a 36 feet of oil we're rolling on three pound seven ounce pins and the the uh the pba what they've done is they've kept the lane stripped very clean in the back end so the scores have been, it's been hard to score early on during the day and as the oil carries down the scores get better and better and the players practiced for almost an hour before we went on the air and they were bowling as quickly as they could the right-handers trying to move that oil down the lane so they could improve the shot looking for the better scores how's the carry been all week you know the carry has been reasonably good if once the player gets lined up to the pocket the problem has been from pair to pair every pair just a, just enough different to make it difficult to line up that shouldn't be a factor tonight though right right it's the one pair and i expect good scores mike and uh, i talked to the players and they feel that comfortable on the shot uh, they think there will be a transition, but as that transition goes, it should actually improve the scores rather than hurt them. As you can see by the graphic there, the scores have been pretty good at times, and they've been pretty bad at times. Well, Mark McDowell averaged 215 on this pair, but Justin Romick only 190, so you think they'll do better than that? I do. I think, uh, I think they had a chance to really open up this pair, and I think the scores should be reasonably good. Uh, right after I say that, of course, this always seems to happen. Well, he just missed the free, <laughs> of the free throw after 10 in a row, you know. The 1 2 10. We'll take another look at that shot. And if you do, there is an out of bounds. If you get the ball out near the channel, now watch this ball. He gets it outside the first arrow, out almost to the, say, the third, fourth board. That's out of bounds. The ball won't hook <clears throat> back from there. You have to keep it inside the first arrow. Hard and straight at this? Well, it's like trying to re reverse hook at it. And, uh, didn't quite get the job done. The spare shooting hasn't been a problem. The most difficult spare for the players that, as far as I could see by watching them in match play for two days, I was here watching this tournament. Uh, the this, this spare shooting has been fairly easy. The, only, the most difficult spare is the 369. Uh, anything on the right hand side where the ball wants to hook rather than skid. The 10 pin's fairly easy, but the 3610, 369, 10, any of that kind of combination is very difficult. Justin leaves the soft 10, comes in a little bit behind the head pin. You can see his average this week. Solid average. <coughs> Cross lane at the 10 pin. As you said, no trouble. 
Well, these guys, you mentioned in the open mic, and I thought it was very important what you said, is all of these guys are very talented. Um, the, the, they're very familiar faces. We've seen them all play before. We've got two Hall of Famers. We've got guys that have been Rookie of the Year. We've got just about anything you could want out there, and we should have some great matches. Plus, you got both right and left-handers on there. So. That's right, and uh, they don't miss spares and get in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> just doesn't happen that way. Will it hit it? Nope. Another soft 10. <clears throat> They're playing in a little farther on the lane than, uh, as I mentioned, I've been watching here for two days. The uh, the shot has been basically somewhere from 15 on the right side, which is the third arrow, out to about the first arrow. And the, the, the important thing here is to keep it in that zone. If you get it inside that zone or outside of it, you just can't strike. Uh, we're going to take a look at that last shot. We'll take a look at that last shot and watch the pin action here. As you see, watch what happens over here on the right-hand side. Watch the, the uh, six-pin. Just jumps in the channel and lays there. Seven-pin seven was staring at him for a second there, too. <laughs> Playing further right than Justin is, right? He is, and he's using a ball that grips. He's using what, what the players call a ball with surface. What that means is that it's a rougher surface, wants to grip the lane and hook a little more, and... Uh, when you go up at him a little bit, the ball wants to jump on you. But again, the lanes are changing very dramatically right now. The players, as I mentioned, they bowled for about an hour. They've been moving the oil around a lot. And this first match might be the lowest scoring match all that we have all day. And, of course, Mark has uh, not been on television in three years. So, uh, Good point. A little bit nervous <laughs> there. Opens in the second and third frame, down 24 pins. Now he's had a little problem with the gripping, though, the bowling ball, obviously, because he's putting another piece of tape in there, try to get a better grip on it working his hand into the ball and you know he's decided he's going to retire this is his last year as a touring player he bought a bowling center um, up in Bellevue Wisconsin called Sugar River Lanes and after his wife Patty and his son Ryan are watching right now well they like that result a little bit better right now we've completed three and a half frames right now Justin Romick is clean he leads by 24 he'll be up in the fourth frame when Earl and I come back after this Bye. Tagamet HB, the most prescribed medication of its kind, is now for heartburn. Justin Romick, up in the fourth frame, he's leading by 24, and uh, he's just made a couple spares and got one strike. So Mark McDowell's got to write his uh, course right now. Uh, he's, uh, he'll get it, he'll get it going again. Justin Romick's one of the guys who can really rev it up the great rotation he gets on the ball mike he lifts right up the side it's almost if you were to watch his hand action it's like someone throwing an underhanded football pass a lateral and if we watch his pat when we do get a chance and uh, these guys the cameras are fantastic they'll show it to us you will get a chance to see he has something on his index finger that orange thing it's one of the grips they use for gripping the ball in the holes normally but he does it to prevent a blister on his finger Here's a good look at him now from the side. When you can see this, this guy is solid. Watch the shoulder stay nice and steady, and the arm swings straight back. There, look at the cup wrist as he comes through. This is what creates all that rotation. You can see that orange grip rotating around the side of the ball, just like you throw on an underhand pass in a football. He really revs up that pass, doesn't yes, he? He does. And there's that grip I was talking about. That prevents a blister on his index finger. If he doesn't wear that on his finger, he gets a big blister. He can't bowl, obviously. It hurts. Well, he must be lifting with that finger on the outside of the ball there. Well, it's legal because it's just like wearing a sticky glove or something like that. So it is within PBA rules. Well, strikes in the fifth frame. Right now, if Mark McDowell wants to get back in this opening match, and we know that he does, he needs to strike here in the fifth and the sixth frame. See him jittering around up there, trying to get comfortable, trying to get something going here on a strike. A little more ball speed there, Mike. And it was blocked. I don't know, he, his body English, I don't know if he was sure that was going to hold or not. Well, he really zipped this one down the lane. Here's a look at the style of Mark McDowell, the youngest PBA president ever at 28. Look at this great arm swing, nice and free. Kind of reminds you of Mike Durbin. He gets through the shot at the bottom, the good balance, a good knee bend, shoulders right over the knee. He gave it all he had there as far as ball speed goes. He got through that one real hard. Hard on this one too, you think? I'm sure. Shots. We got a match. Well, 
thought you said he would come back. Just a lucky guess, Mike. Just a lucky guess. Lucky guess. <coughs> Justin up in the sixth frame, leading now only by three pins. Still threes. He oh, smacks my. his hand, leaves the light seven pin. Well, that hit, the reason he's upset, and uh, usually when you see a redhead get upset, you can see the blood coming up in the, in the neck and the face get red, but it's because he normally would carry that hit. A light hit from uh, one of these guys with these resin reactive bowling balls almost always will strike. Cross lane at the seven pin. Has it. And college game day. It's Chris Fowler, Lee Corso, and Craig James. They discuss Alabama's life on probation, the rise of Northwestern football and other big games across the country. Then they're followed by Penn State trying to recover at Purdue at 12.30. And at 6.30 Eastern time, it's a big one. Tennessee going to Birmingham against Alabama. Isn't it amazing how the game can change so quickly? A minute ago, Mark McDowell was trying to get back in the match. Now he has a chance to take the lead. That's what string of strikes will do, you know. Well, we see the shot of Justin Rolick here in the seventh frame going in there. He leads by three pins. Mark McDowell's on three. Well, now, seventh frame, his first opportunity to take the lead in the opening match. behind the head pin as you mentioned earlier once it's behind the head pin Mike it very seldom will kick that 10 out well still a tight match with uh, the 8th 9th and 10th to go <coughs> Mark using the same ball to shoot spares as he does for strikes at the 10 pin has it he struggled the last few years I asked him what the problems were. Well, I think it's a lot of factors. Uh, I guess my priorities have changed a little. I'm a father now, uh, own a bowling center back home. Uh, just a little tired of the routine, and I really just haven't bowled well. I haven't adapted to the new bowling balls and, and the conditions we bowl on out here on tour. Uh, I feel like I really put it together this week, and that's why I'm here today. Eighth frame, trails by four. Well, there's no, you know, there's no question that the resin reactive balls that have been available in the last few years have changed the way the game is played, and it's made the different players, stars, uh, and other players that maybe were stars five years ago are struggling. Players of the caliber like a Marshall Holman and people like that are having problems adapting to the changes in the bowling balls, and uh, the game changes. It goes on. It doesn't wait for you, and it can be very cruel at times. So why? I mean, what changes... What's different about the reactive resin that would have caused people to, to become better or worse? Well, it'll hit, it actually hits harder, creates more area on the lane for a certain type of release. In other words, gives a player a bigger target area. And uh, for other players that maybe had a great release to begin with, with a plastic or urethane ball, this ball overreacts. And because this ball hits so hard, it's hard for them to keep up. You can't strike as often, so you can't keep up. Justin got a double. He likes it here in Detroit. He talked about it. I'm not sure. I think I might have to move here, though. This is uh, my second telecast in a Michigan area and won the U.S. Open in Troy last year of 94. And I came here and things kind of fell in place. So I'm thinking about maybe moving here next year. Well, he's thinking about winning this opening match as he leads by 15 right now. It's the ninth frame. He's got his first double. A little extra time. That's a big shot for him. And a great shot. Perfect. It's interesting to see, as you mentioned, Mike, and I think it's important that the people at home pay attention to this, the two different ways to play this pair of lanes. you got one guy throwing a ball that grips, that creates surface. That's Mark McDowell right here. And he's actually going up the back of the ball, trying to line it to the pocket. Justin Romek is rotating around the side and trying to keep the ball out to the right.
right and hook it on the back end hard. So two different ways to play the same pair of lanes, the same lane condition. And Mark McDowell leaving a light seven pin on a hit that he thought for sure would carry. You know, both these players were outstanding collegiate bowlers, too. That's the same hit that Justin Romek got a little upset about on this lane, lane 40, when he left the seven pin. Right. I think Mark McDowell bowled at uh, West Texas State. And uh, Justin Romek was at Wichita. Was he? Well, the collegiate programs have really, really done well for the professional bowlers and great amateur bowlers that are bowling around the country now. They've, they've, they've created a lot of great fundamentals. These guys are well advanced when they come out on the tour now. They've, they've had the opportunity to be under some great tutorship at various colleges that have got them the fundamentals down pat and taught them how to adjust to varying lane conditions. And uh, it just, it's just amazing how much knowledge they have when they're 19, 20, 21 years old. chance Mark has if he strikes out for 202 and then something disastrous would happen to Justin in the 10th frame. Hasn't given up yet. Well, it's going to be early retirement, in my opinion, right now for Mark McDowell, and uh, unfortunately, but I think, he, you know, actually, in talking with him, he's just so proud of what he's doing with his life at home with his son, Ryan, and his wife, Patty, that I think he's in a hurry to get back there. <laughs> I really do. Not the big hurry that he'd want to lose this game, but I know he wants to get home and get and be with them. Well, except for the second and third frame, or maybe uh, nerves were a part of the case there. He's bowled an outstanding game from the fourth frame off. A couple of ten pins in the seventh frame, in the seventh, eighth, and ninth, the rest strikes. Yeah, maybe even that seventh pin that he left in the ninth <coughs> frame would have been a key hit for him. He might have put a lot more pressure, I'm sure, on Justin Romick. More 10 pin finishing with 201. Justin Romick with a decent count will be our winner. We'll move on to match number two. Eight pins, what he's looking for, but actually it's a strike. He's really rolling the ball well, and uh, I like the way he's getting it out on the lane in front of him, releasing it up to slightly on the upswing to create a little bit of a, uh, of a loft in the shot. And, he does that by standing up at the at the foul line a little taller so that he can create that loft and get the ball down the lane without it hooking early. Well, he's really doing that very well. Maybe checking some things out there. Knocks out the 6-10, leaves only the 3 pin. So Justin Romick. For the conversion here, we're ball 227. He's the winner of our opening match over Mark McDowell. We only had 201. So youth prevailed here. Justin Romick, the youngest person on our telecast, 28. <laughs> Mark McDowell finishes fifth. We can see a nice check. Says hi to his family back home. I think nice he was waving goodbye. goodbye. <laughs> well, match number one is history. We're back with average builders and a little bit about adjusting right after this best. Might be on us. Midnight Madness, Saturday at midnight on ESPN and 1 a.m. on ESPN2. <laughs> My ball just went through the heart of the pins. I left the split. Happens every week. I'm sure it happens to you every week when you go down for your night of bowling on your weekly league. The question is, what am I going to do the next time I come up on that lane to keep that ball from going through the nose? And when that happens to you, what are you going to do? And that's what I want to talk about for tonight's Average Bowl because I travel across the country and I watch league bowlers and, and pro-am bowlers. I notice that many of them have a problem making adjustments, unlike our pros who make adjustments very, very well. And they also have a problem uh, learning to read their ball reaction properly. And that's something really fundamental for a pro. So for tonight's Average Builder, we'll talk about adjustments and about reading our ball reaction. First of all, the adjustment. Now, the principle I want you to keep in mind is that for every board that I move left on the approach, and I'm speaking for right-handers here, if you're a left-hander, just reverse it. Every board I move left and keep my target the same at the arrows, it changes where the ball winds up at the pins by a board and a half. So if I move two boards back here, keep the same target down there, it'll bring the ball up three boards to the right at the pins. 
That shot went through the heart of the pins. The nose is generally the 20th board. The pocket is the 17th board. So if I move two boards left, hit the same target at the arrows, theoretically should put the ball right in the 1-3 pocket, but that's not the adjustment that I'm going to recommend to you tonight. Which leads me to the second topic, and that's reading the ball reaction. What we want our ball to do is to skid through the first part of the lane and hook at the back part of the lane. When it hooks too soon, adjustments become very difficult. So the adjustment that we want to get is to get more into the oil, because most bowling centers have more oil in the middle of the lane, and it's a little bit drier on the outside of the lane. So the adjustment that I'm recommending to you as we move this left with our feet and target is not a big one, just two boards with my feet and one with my target. The next time I come up on that lane, if that brings the ball into the 1-3 pocket, then I'm just going to stay right there until it goes high again. If it still goes through the nose, then what I want to do the next time I come up is move another two boards with my feet and one with my target. And keep doing that until it brings it up into the 1-3 or the 1-2 pocket. The point is that I can't keep standing in the same place and throwing at the same target without moving or making an adjustment and expect good things to happen. Now, earlier that shot that I threw went through the heart of the pins. I'll move the two boards left and one with my target. Let's see if it's the right adjustment for this lane. Here we are. <clears throat> right around the second arrow. High flush. Boy, what can I tell you? It's easy when you're not doing it for a living. So remember the principle. The adjustment is two boards to the left with my feet, one with my target. Reading that ball reaction, we want to watch it. Get to a point in the lane where it skids through the heads and hooks at the back end. Next week, it's the Great Lakes Classic from Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's on another arena telecast, and we know how exciting they can be. October the 18th, 7.30 Eastern Time. Of course, we'll have another average builder. Be sure and join us then. Well, Justin Romick made all the right adjustments in that opening match as he was a winner. 227 to 201 over Mark McDowell. We got a guy on the other side of the lane with Just Rage Staybrook coming up next. 28 year old Justin Romick takes on 36 year old Jess Staybrook. Quite a difference in size here, too, as Justin's only 5'9, says 145 pounds. He looks heavier than that. That's with his bowling ball. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> no, Jess, really. Jess is uh, 6'1, 175. <laughs> way to get it started and uh, as so often happens the player uh, well it happens all the time the player that's higher in the standings gets his choice of starting lanes and and Jess has decided he wants to finish the match first so he let Justin lead off Jesse one of those guys can really turn it up he creates a lot of back end with the ball can really hook it hard throws it hard and hooks it hard a little bit too hard there Mike Almost out the six, six eight, eight yeah. leaves the uh, nine, and we can see uh, match play appearances right here. Jess with twelve of them. Interesting. He didn't even bowl last week when we have fourteen lefties in the top twenty-four. Or so yeah. Right. How's that for picking the right week to go home for <laughs> a vacation? Huh? And he's here this week and the only one. Well, maybe he knew something they didn't know. He figured he couldn't do it with fourteen lefties there, but he can do it when he's the only one. Huh? How about you? How many times uh, did you miss weeks when they bowled real well? Every time I would skip a week, Mike, and I'd come back, everybody would always tell me, boy, you should have been there last week. You'd have killed him. You know, <laughs> here's a look at the style of Jess Stayrook, and this guy is so strong physically, it's amazing. But look at his right foot. You see him plant that foot, and the reason he does that is he's wearing tennis shoes, and he feels that by wearing the tennis shoes on both feet now, not just his sliding foot, because he doesn't slide at all. He plants his foot. What it does is it makes him have better balance, and he feels like he eliminates the approaches. Any vagaries in the approaches are completely eliminated because he doesn't slide. He just plants his foot, and he has more confidence now that he won't slip or stick or anything of that nature. And so he just gets up there, whereas the, the tennis shoes, he's very calm, relaxed. Because of that, he feels it like builds his confidence because he takes the approach part of the game completely out of it. any effect on his ability how about, to make the shots. Injuries, does that bother his knee at all? Or? Well, he, he said that he doesn't because he plants his foot and he doesn't twist on it. He just goes straight through. As you can see, he's not putting a lot of torque on it. Uh, if he were to twist sideways, he would have a problem. But uh, he is so strong, as you can see by how hard he threw the ball at the seventh pin there. Uh, he works out hard. He stays in great shape. And uh, Do you think uh, that's a good idea, or is that 
something you wouldn't teach. I don't think I would teach people to do that because uh, the tendency is that you could hurt yourself if you weren't careful by either sticking or planting or trying to slide with the shoe on, things like that. Or you could even leave a residue on the approach from the rubber sole of the tennis shoe and the next player to follow you could stick on that and fall down. Now, just because he doesn't slide, just stay rook, because he doesn't slide, doesn't leave a residue. But if he were to leave a residue, uh, the other players could complain and he would have to take those shoes off. And that decision would be made then by the tournament director, Johnny Campos. He would go out and make the final determination of whether there is truly any resin on the approach. And if there is, then he would say, you can't wear those anymore. Well, personally, I prefer the traditional style like Justin. He does fine with his. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever works for you. And, uh, for That's Jess true, Day, whatever works for you. For Jess Day Rook, it's plant the foot and pull it through and throw it hard. There's a look at the tennis shoes. Well, there certainly is a, a uh, I wonder what brand truth that he takes the, the, the approaches right out of the equation there, doesn't he? What do you bet, Nike or Adidas? <laughs> I don't know. Reebok. Reebok, huh? I think so. Okay, here we go. Plant and throw. A lot of rotation. And strike. There's the reaction. If Jesse gets it going, he will be jumping and running. I'll tell you what, he's a very emotional player and uh, very, very much a competitor. Here's a look at that. Now watch the approach here of Jess Dayruff. We're just going to see him plant the foot. Look at that. No slide. It doesn't move at all. And you saw the ball pass the, pass the foot there on the way by. But uh, that's amazing to do that. I could never do that. My knees would never, ever hold up. Well, you have a little trouble with your knees anyway, right? I have trouble with my whole body. Are you kidding? Trying for a double. Got a break there, Mike, leaving only the 2-4. Could have been a lot worse through the middle of the head pin, and uh, <clears throat> very easily could have left the 10 pin with it. Yeah, but the trouble is that uh, frames are going by as we see that he defeated Justin Romick twice. But now is the one that counts, right? Well, not only that, but it's not often you can beat any one of these top pros three times in the same week. So maybe this is kind of a get-even game for Justin Romick. At the 2-4, no trouble with the spare. Jess is a great spare shooter. He is. Well, we talked about that also, and all five of these guys wouldn't be where they are if they didn't make their spares. You know, I, I, as I go around the country and watch people in the pro-ams and watch people as uh, we take a look at the $25,000 available, if he should... Two or 12 in a row, but yeah. uh, he's pretty hard three. to do. He's, he's very capable of it, no question. But you watch people around the country, and I go around watching them bowl and, and what they're trying to do out there, and you, I thought your, your average builder was a very timely thing, uh, the fact that if you learn how to adjust just a little bit to the changes or the vagaries in the lanes, and uh, you'll improve your average. Well, I think a lot of people... Uh that just do it on a recreation basis are sometimes afraid to move their feet and uh, figure that they can't do that, that they're not a pro. But in reality, uh, I like Norm Duke's approach, you know, that you got to take a little challenge there and, and, and do things. 3 six, ten. You said, now, this was a difficult spare this week. This is one of the more difficult spares. There, uh, this and if the nine pin were standing would be that much more difficult. It compounds it amazingly. But... Uh, the ball either wants to hook very sharply as it gets to the three pin or it will slide by it if he gets it going too hard without much turn on it. See how he plays it here. He's moving to the left. Trying to hook it up into it, and he did very well. Not a bit of trouble. Justin Romick, four in a row. Spare leads by 31 pins right now. Actually, I guess it's 28 pins. I was reading the wrong number up here. So, see that he's averaged very well on this pair, but he's going to have to get uh, some strikes going to maintain that average. Looks like uh, Jess Stayrook is making a little move on the approach here. Maybe you listen to your average builder. Oh, oh hi. Hello. He Solid went the nine. other way. He moved left, it looked Solid like. Solid nine. Yeah, it looks like he went more direct with less uh, side rotation, just a little more forward roll. We're going to take a look at the ball hitting the pins. Look at the reactionary. What he actually did was chop the five straight back off the nine. That just means the ball hit too hard. That once cost you a new car and 300 on television, didn't it? It did. It uh, sure, certainly did. Solid nine. You always bring back these good memories, Mike. Hey, it's the PGA Tour on ESPN. Jim Kelly and Gary Koch will bring you all four rounds of the Las Vegas Invitational from the Las Vegas Country Club. Starts Thursday, October the 11th, 4.30.
4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 o'clock on the coast. I get a chance to play that course this summer, Earl. Hmm. You think you can play as well as they can? Um, no, 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 no. Okay. I had a good time, though. All right, off the solid nine to see if Jack, Jesse can just keep his concentration, make the good shot here, get back into the match. Long way to go. We're only halfway there. Well, he's moved out. Better reaction. Now he just needs the pins to cooperate. We're halfway through the second match. And Justin Romick leads by 29. Earl and I'll be back. Justin Romick up on lane 40. It's the sixth frame. Leads by 29, and he knows that no lead is safe. He has to add to it. That's true, and uh, especially against a player of Stayrick's caliber. This guy, as we mentioned, is in the running for player of the year. And he desperately needs to win today. His third win of the year would put him in the running, no question about it. Now, I don't know whether he's made some kind of adjustment to carry that 10. You know, he left three 10 pins in a row in the last game, and he's been snapping it out ever since then. Now, as long as he doesn't get the ball too wide, that's the key for him. Because if he gets it too wide, there's a, there is, as I mentioned, a slight out of bounds out there. And the ball will hit that oil, and then it goes just a little bit farther down the lane before it hooks back, and that's when he leaves the 10. And we can see the score right there. If you strike Just Stayrook all the way out in that game, he can still finish with 248, so this isn't over yet. Trying for one more. All right, he looks solid. Well, the entry angle is just uh, just phenomenal. He's got the ball entering the pins at just the perfect angle to carry all ten. And that's when the ball's entering at that angle and rolling that hard, you see all ten pins go straight back. It just it, that's just perfect. You can't do it any better than that. Just needs a double here in the seventh frame badly. <laughs> That basically is going to end this match. It would appear that way. I don't see anything going to change for Justin. He's really lined up and rolling the ball well. And at this point, he's going to be somewhere in the 50, 50, 50 behind. Yeah. Watch this one get down there in a hurry. This guy can throw it hard. He will throw this one hard. Try to bounce those pins. He made the 7-10 once on television. Opens here in the seventh frame. But he's had a great year this year. And we did talk to him earlier about that year. There's really no explanation. I guess I've been uh, just practicing hard, working hard, trying to stay in shape, and just trying to figure out the lanes. The equipment is a lot more versatile nowadays. That's helped tremendously. Um, I don't know. Maybe the lane man has some help with it, too. <laughs> well, a little pat on the back for the lane guys. How about that, huh? Oh, my. Well, that shows you it's just not your day when that happens, and there's a little wry smile from Mr. Stayrook. You know, he made this in Tucson about three years ago. People, the crowd's really into this. They want him Some to try people to realize it, it. And as he tries for the 710, ESPN brings you all of the scores, the playoff results, every other score from the Hockey League at 10, 30, and 50 past the hour. When he made it before, we have that for you. It looks a little different there. Look at the haircut. He yeah. looks so young, doesn't he? And watch this shot. Just like it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Back live. Justin Romick. Just keeps striking. He says, uh, you can make those splits. I don't want to leave them. No, he's not going to leave them hitting it there. That's for sure. You know, it seems like... Almost always, just one guy that figures them out really well, gets lined up, and just crushes them for a couple of games. And then the lanes change a little bit again. And maybe he struggles a little bit, and the guy coming over, who is a tremendous talent, obviously, and David Ozio, just walks over and he's lined up. It's just it's strange how this game can be. But, uh, right now, he prediction for the next game? Is that what, what you're doing here? No, I'm not predicting anything, but I tell you what, uh, they don't get any easier as you go up the ladder here. Two Hall of Famers waiting in the wings. Well, he's knocking off here. He knocked off a former president, now a candidate for player of the year, and he's got a Hall of Famer coming up in the next match. Mm. another solid nine <laughs> well actually if you look at his score you think he was bowling horrible but he only made a couple of shots that weren't in the pocket you know the, the 710 was in the pocket and uh, the uh, he had this the 467 there which wasn't a good shot but he left a couple of good seven pins a solid eight it's not a good day for the lefty 
And we see the scoreboard there, a lopsided victory for Justin. Jess is going for pride right now and uh, wants to finish it off at 195. Well, like you said, Mike, uh, Jess Dayrook beat Justin Romick twice this week, but unfortunately for J Jess Dayrook, it was the wrong game to win. He should have won this one today if he wanted to continue on. And Justin Romick gets a little revenge and an opportunity to go on and maybe win this event. Well, the way he's uh, throwing the ball, the way how he's lined up, you would think that uh, if he keeps like that, the odds are in his favor. And Jess pounds it out. Well, we watched uh, earlier, you and I both stood there and watched uh, David Ozio practice warming up before they, they went on the air, and he looked awesome, didn't he? He's uh, taking four steps this week, and he really looks solid at the line. Oh, he was a pretty bowler, but he even looks better now. I like his hand action. It's uh, it's not a big crank, but it's, uh, and it's it's not right up the back, but it's enough to get everything down. Jess Dayrook finishes with 193. Justin Romick, if he strikes it out, he'll finish with 277. However, we're not going to stay around to watch that. Justin is our winner of the second match. When we come back, we're going to take a look at other cashers, including the top 24. And next week, be sure to join us for the Great Lakes Classic. We're on our way to Grand Rapids and the Welsh Auditorium for Arena Bowling. That's October the 18th, 7.30 Eastern Time, 4.30 on the coast. And there were other people that made money here in sixth place. Uh, Turtle, he's there all the time. He finished sixth. Tim Chris, Roger Bowker always bowls well in the fall. Don Moser had a great week, uh, finishing eighth. And of course, he had there's two 299 games. Just fantastic. Robert Lawrence finally getting it back together. His first top 24 finish since 1994 Tournament of Champions. And tenth, uh, Bob Lord Boo Boo, as he is known, hasn't won since 93. And of course, in 11th, Danny Wiseman from Baltimore, Maryland. And Ed Richardson looking for his second career telecast. Didn't miss by much. And Walter A. Williams, the superstar, he's still the man to beat on any given week. And next, Ron Palumbi, another guy that doesn't slide, a former Rookie of the Year in Ryan Schaefer. Joe Furple, fourth straight time in the top 24. And Chris Hooper, that's his first time. Len Blakely, they say he's got a great physical game. And another guy with a great physical game, Del Ballard Jr. And Bob Spaulding, a big guy with a powerful delivery. And Brian LeClaire, he's constantly improving. Kelly Kaufman, his peers consider him the most powerful strike ball on tour, but consistency might be a problem. Jimmy Davis, a solid regional player looking to make his mark on the national tour. And Jeff Lizzie, who spends a lot of time in the gym building up upper body strength. And the alternate this week, the redheaded Texan superstar Mark Williams. Well, Justin Romick, two four-baggers. That's an easy way to bowl 250. He wins 252. Just stay rook 193. In our next match, we've got Hall of Famer David Ozio still looking for title number 11. He's taking on a red-hot Justin Romick. Stay warm. And it's really hard tracking shots with these shades and the medallion. Mm. Forget it. And we got a great shot of Taylor Lanes here. There's our championship pair, David Ozio, getting ready for the semifinal match. And joining us in the booth here, we have 15-time champion, former PBA Player of the Year, Walter Ray Williams, Jr. You got a favorite in this match? Well, I think Justin looks pretty good, but David's <laughs> an awful tough bowler. Um, they're both uh, hey, great Hey, you're players. taking both sides of the issue here. Well, Come on. Uh, it's I'm kind of that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it looks like uh, Justin's going to get the finish on the right lane again. David uh, evidently wants to post his score first. Well, this, this should be a great match. Two really good players, uh, the young Justin Romick, already lined up, ready to go, and David Ozio, as good as anybody at making shots when he really has to. Well, he's been doing that all night. Walter, did you, were you in this position? You had to come over and bowl somebody that really was lined in and tuned into the pair? Uh, about a 50 times. <laughs> So is there any <laughs> special way that you prepare to come out throwing strikes? You just got to go out and, and get lined up the best you can and throw great shots. Uh, you can trip them. Both of you, you can always trip them or something like that. <laughs> I've thought of that several times. <laughs> Ooh, that was a great shot. That was a great opening shot. Unfortunately, it didn't carry the 10-pin, and that could be the difference in this match. I think both players 
uh, Walter. I think both players are going to be able to hit the pocket pretty well, just who's going to carry the corners. Yeah, Justin definitely showed that he could carry last game. He carried very well. Cross lane at the 10 pin, changes balls, and changes steps. Five steps on the spare. I mean, I'm assuming he had four steps on the first ball. Did anybody watch? I well, you never know with him. him. All right, it, but uh, the, the different spare ball, that's uh, something some of the players like to use, including myself. Uh, the harder ball will go a little straighter, and if you happen to accidentally hit the ball a little bit, it still will go a little straighter, and uh, some of these reactive balls will re really jump on the back end sometimes. Give you more margin for error, huh? Theoretically. Yeah. Another Vegas. solid 10. Now, what's causing that? Uh, the entry angles you always talk about? I think so. I think that's the most important thing in the game. It's not how much rotation you can get on the ball as far as when you hit solid in the pocket. If you're going to strike solid in the pocket, it's the angle the ball enters the pocket. What do you think? Well, I think that's part of it. Uh, and also, if he hits a little higher, a little lighter, it's a strike. So he's just hitting that exact wrong spot for a solid 10. Exactly. Uh, yeah, a little lighter, it would carry every time from there. Or a little higher. A little higher, yeah. I think most of the players would actually prefer hitting a little higher in the pocket where they're more likely to maybe leave a solid eight or something, but <laughs> that's uh, definitely kinda, what you want to do. Kind of like with those solid nines. Exactly. That, that's the type of shot that the players like to hit the pocket in, but when you hit light, you can scatter them up and really get lots of good strikes that way also. That's the kind of like that. Plus, huh? That's the high plus <laughs> shot I like to see. That's what I like to do. Did you see that pin almost come back and stand up? It danced around a little bit, but I, I don't think it was going to stand up. Justin gave it a second look, though. I mean, kind of like a... <laughs> Well, you wouldn't dare. <laughs> when you're bowling out there, you think anything bad's going to happen to you. So when you see a pin dance, dancing like that, it definitely scares you. Doesn't Justin Romek, just to look at him and watch the rotation of his ball going down the lane, kind of remind you of Mark Williams? I mean, he's got the red hair. <laughs> he gets the same kind of rotation on the ball. It, it's uh, a little different. He's got a little bit more spin to it. Mark's got a little bit more side roll to it. Yeah, Mark's a lot bigger and stronger, obviously. Well, well Justin, Justin Romek... Justin's got a, he's a pretty healthy guy there. He, he can push some pounds around if he wants to. Well, he's uh, served notice to David Ozio that he better find a way to carry the 10 pin quickly. He's looking for that 25,000 again, huh? Perfect. We're going to take a look at the style of David Ozio. Well, Ray, you want to jump on this? Well, he's just textbook all the way. I, if I was going to teach somebody, that's the way I would teach him, not the way I throw the ball. He, he, he's just perfect all the way through. And uh, The closer up on the approach, he's able to do that. I, I myself take long steps, and it just doesn't, you know, I, I need to scoot back a little bit. I take a really long step. Got that out a little bit. He was looking for that love shot, but he didn't get it. Let me ask you a question, Walter Ray. Based on what you just did analyzing mm -hmm. David Ozio's game, you said he was textbook. And I agree with you 100%. David Ozio is the product of great instruction. There's no question he's had a lot of instruction, and it shows in his game. It's where, don't you feel that you are more of a natural, your style is natural talent. You just get up there, and your hand-eye coordination obviously is exceptional. And you're, you're more of a just get up and let it happen type guy, aren't you? Well, I guess, but for me, it's, I'm more of a physical player. I, uh, I like to put everything into it, and David's really free-flowing. He doesn't, you know, it's just a real relaxed arm swing and, and very natural, basically, where I'm, I really like to put everything into it, even if I'm throwing it straight or trying to hook it. Justin, he just keeps throwing strikes. He says, I don't care how. <laughs> Ten pins go down. Well, he's a, he's a gamer, this guy. He comes and gives it everything he's got. I think Justin Romek's one of the toughest competitors out there. If he has an opportunity to score and shoot a, shoot a number at you, he doesn't ever back down. He just goes after you. It's like a little tiger, you know? Yeah. We, we see the, the competitive nature of the PBA Tour here. We have the youngest player in our telecast right now going against the oldest, and uh, they're both outstanding players. Oh, definitely. That's that's one of the things about bowling. You can do it when you're younger, when you're older. And these guys are definitely showing it. They're both great players. Well, Justin had two four-baggers in the last game, and uh, now he's said, I'm not going to stop it for It's going to be more, you know. And the proof of, uh, you know, what you were just saying, Walter, about that uh, age is no handicap, and John Handigard earlier this summer won on the national tour at 57. Yeah, and he competed this week. I think he also got a check this week. Finished 27, as a matter of fact. Another 10 pin, and that was uh, 
just a little light in the pocket. Yeah, just really the ball didn't uh, didn't look like it really hit that hard either, did it to you? Yeah, when it hits a little light, sometimes it hits. It, it's other, another thing. If it hits a little bit lighter than that, he'd rip the rack to pieces a little higher, and he kicks a ten out. But right there, it's just a weak ten, and if, if it hits just perfect, it'll bounce the six out and knock the ten out. But well, what just can he do? The break. What can he change? What can he change? Can he change? For anything? the most part, he's right there. He just needs to. Here's another look at the ball in the pocket. Entering yeah. the pocket. It was just a little light in the pocket, really. That's look at the deflection, though. See, this is my point. Did yeah. the ball deflect to the right? Yeah. It, that's it's why I thought maybe it didn't roll six. it quite as well. And you yeah. can see the pin laying in the channel near the 10. It's not sp you know, spanking that 6 out and hitting the 10. Yeah, it looks to me like, again, like it, uh, it just didn't rotate quite the way David normally rotates. Yeah, might have got just a hair hard or a hair right. That one, that's a little lighter yet than the week lot, the lot. court, and he got a strike. Yeah, <laughs> the ball, that ball had a lot more rotation on it. <laughs> Justin Romick up in the sixth frame, and uh, Taylor Lanes here will pay 25000 if anyone bowls 300 on our championship telecast tonight. We're bowling right through, staying right here, not going to commercial break as we normally would, as long as Justin keeps striking. One of the things I noticed about the competition during the week is in the early rounds, the conditions were very difficult. And as the day progressed, the length conditions got better and the scoring pace got a lot better. So, if you can see the scoring pace picking up already, I think they already broke the lanes in in their hour of practice session. I think the scoring here is going to be very good these last two games. Well, we uh, have won 300 game earlier this week. Had one 290 where the guy had the first 11 and threw it in the <laughs> channel. Remember yeah, that? I played golf with him today. So, uh, <laughs> we're not going to say what his name was, folks. So. He does turn the ball a little bit, though. Mm -hmm. Seventh frame, lane 39. speed it looked like yeah. the last game when he got a little bit soft and went to the beach maybe he was trying to overcorrect for that thinking about it out thought himself maybe there but two four five how does he make this well i would throw straight and hard at and i think he does he's learned how to throw the ball fairly straight on the spares and he zips it down there pretty good no trouble so Justin Romick's string is broken. However, he still leads by 49. But don't go away. David Ozio can still strike out for 248. Stay tuned. And you can see there that David has finished third twice already this year. And he's uh, gunning for a third third. Unless he can keep a string of strikes starting right now. And we were just talking about that. The in the break, uh, when you're not carrying, that sometimes you do a little fiddling or try and soften up the speed or something, and that 10 pin suddenly has company, and it's got a bunch of company right now. Yeah, he, d he definitely got a little softer on that shot. I think he moved in a little bit. I think he went more to the oil. There's, there, there's more oil in the middle today than there has been throughout the week in talking to the players while they were practicing. Uh, before he we went on the air, they said that they felt that there was more oil in the middle of the lane, Walter Ray, and because of that, maybe he felt he could go deeper in and get a different entry angle into the pocket and maybe carry the tent bin. Do you think that's possible? I, I don't know. I'm not out there bowling, so it's hard to say. Exactly yeah, you're up here. You're an expert. Right. You're supposed to speculate now. <laughs> I, I, if I was going high, I would move left, but if I was going light, I wouldn't move left, so... Uh, that's personal for me. I, I would, if anything, I'd move a hair right, but maybe he got a little slower, got left or something. Would you throw it harder when you made that move? No, I would try not to. Unless, well, if I was leaving a four pin, I might. But if I was going light, leaving ten pins or weak pins, if anything, I'd move right. I would. <coughs> it's the NHL hockey on ESPN. Mario Lemieux, four-time scoring champion and two-time MVP, is back. He and his Pittsburgh Penguins travel to the United Center to take on the Chicago Blackhawks. That's Thursday, October the 12th, 8 o'clock Eastern Time, and 5 o'clock on the coast. And ESPN, as they always do, is showing you all the hockey sports. Well, maybe checking out his area or something like that. A yeah. snap of his fingers says, shucks, I miss. Maybe he just made a bad shot, Mike. <laughs> well, that's possible, yeah. <laughs> We've got a little room out there, but I don't think he has that much. I th it's, it's kind of amazing. These last two games have been almost blowouts, even though technically the bowlers haven't really bowled that much different matches. You know, hitting the, number po the pocket number of times, and just the ones carrying Justin's getting all the strikes, and his opponents aren't. Well, David Ozio, 18th year on tour. Boy, that's a long time. Well, that struck. 
He hasn't won in three years. We talked to him about what effect that's having on him. Well, I think that's something, as far as the tour goes, that you have to expect, even if you're a great player. Um, I think that we work hard enough on our games that sometimes things just don't gel. My game has not been 100% now for a couple of years. I had six TV shows last year and a couple earlier this year, but my game still hasn't been solid. Until recently, some work's been done on it. I've spent a lot of time on it, and it's starting to come around, you know. So I'm hoping for a new David Ozio in the future, and hopefully um, I'm going to be a force to be contended with. I'm looking forward to it. Well, it's taking no time as he converts the 10 pin. Tonight is not David's night. He's going to finish out with 193 with a strike. Basically the same score that uh, Jeff Stayrook had. Justin Romick is going to move on for the championship match. And Brian Voss better come over striking. He had better, yes. And Walter Ray, before you go, I got one more question for you. The lane condition here was a split house. The lane condition compared to pair from watching you guys in match play seemed to be completely different, just lane to lane even. Do you think that the ability to adjust very quickly was a difference? That's why these five guys are on here? I think that definitely helps, but it helps when you're when you're lined up right, throwing the ball well, you're getting a decent score, you have a little bit more confidence in yourself, and when you go to another pair that's a little bit different, you, you have that confidence to make the right adjustments, and when you didn't bowl exceptionally well like I did at times, you can really get some bad scores out there. <laughs> what did you do this week? Uh, I did everything. The, the qualifying rounds, I ended up uh, hooking the ball a lot and qualified pretty decent, but the morning sessions were really the tough part, and I just had trouble, even though you know, I, I'm supposed to be a good grind-out player. I just was having trouble doing that. I, I just wasn't able to do it. And then last night, the lanes opened up, and I started bowling better again. So, At the bucket. Here are the Coke proprietors of uh, Taylor Lanes, Leon and Ted Dobbins. One of my biggest supporters out here. Are they? Yeah, Ted loves watching the bowling, and he likes to watch me bowl. He says he's going to go to Grand Rapids and watch a little bit. So, well, It's always nice to have uh, people like that in your corner. Justin with one more practice shot. Ready for the next match. There goes David. Third place, $5,500. Not what he was looking for tonight. This man, though, just rolling along. He's the winner. When we come back, we're going to do Championship Frame, a review of the three previous messages. We'll take this break right now. And now it's time for Championship Frame. In our opening match, Justin got a lot of strikes. This was one of them in the ninth frame, Earl. And this is the one that really put the match away as far as uh, Mark McDowell was concerned. Uh, he ends up winning this match by 26 pins, but... Uh, this was really getting him lined up also for the next match, which wasn't going to get any easier. And we take a look, 227, 201, Justin Romick rolling right along. Now he goes into match number two against Jess Stayrook, and he had a lot of strikes. And we come back to, yeah, and we come back to the same shot, Mike, right here in the ninth frame. Uh, this is just really an end of a big string that ended this match very early. Uh, Jess Stayrook never really had much of an opportunity he couldn't carry, and uh, Romek, as you can see, is quite happy with the results of this one. A big win for him. Two four-baggers in that game, 252 to 193 for Jess Stayrook, who had a lot of problems. And in match number three, David Ozio still had a chance here in the seventh frame. He did, but at this point, Romek had already started this match with a six-bagger on a strike now, going into the seventh for David Ozio, and this was the end of the match as far as he had any chance at all to win. That was it right there. The big four, and... Justin Romek went on to another big win. And again, 243 to 191. So Justin Romek keeps rolling through opponents. This time, we want to thank Walter A. Williams for being with us, uh, helping to commentate on that match. And in our championship match, Hall of Famer Brian Voss taking on a red-hot Justin Romek. Stay with us. We're live here for the Greater Detroit Open at Taylor Lanes in Taylor, Michigan. And there's some of the championship banners of past champions for this uh, outstanding event. We can see some of the names on there. If we can try and make them out right now. Brian Goble right there. Eric Forkel, Chris Warren, Don, well, Don Moser, Jimmy Johnson. Not all of those people won this event, but they definitely were ones that bowled well, made the championship round. Well, 
Justin again gets the start on the left lane, finish on the right. It's been the pattern all night long. It has, and it's kind of interesting. And I think it's not a matter of the lane condition, even though in talking with the players, they say the right lane has a little bit more oil or it's a little slicker, and it's been that way all week. The right-hand lane has been a little, a little more oily than the left lane. Maybe they want to finish where the lane hooks more. Maybe they just feel they want to get done first. I don't know, Mike, but I kind of like the idea of getting done first, putting a score up and letting the other guy shoot at it. How'd you feel about that? Well, I usually based it on the on the lane that I liked the best or how my opponent was doing. And sometimes I bowl better if I knew what I had to have. So a lot of times I would pick to finish on the right lane. Mm -hmm. Of course, I didn't lead as many, nearly as many tournaments as you did. I won my tournaments coming up, so the other guy was picking. It's kind of interesting here. Brian Boss playing deeper than anyone else has. In other words, more toward the center of the lane. And he's got just enough of the head pin to get him to get that great wall shot. Let's take a look at the classic style of Hall of Famer, Brian Boss. The great arm swing. This is one of the best arm swings ever in the game of bowling. Look at the body position, the ball position. Great knee. And look how low he stays. And look at his steady head. And watch the pin action. The head pin goes to the wall. Does a lot of damage in the back row. Well, it's kind of a bucket crumbler there. A bucket uh, crumbler, huh? Got the job done. The OBC. This is where he's playing. That's fourth arrow, folks. He's the only guy that's been in that deep, and he's getting it done. <laughs> and there's his son holding his hands over his ears. Joshua says, it's too noisy in here. <laughs> Dad. Keep the noise down, will you? I'm trying to sleep. Well, we can see it wasn't much of a ma battle in uh, in match play, but uh, that doesn't matter right now. I'll tell you, Justin Romack only won 10 of his 24 matches in match play, but he's making up for it right now. He's on a run, three in a row. Well, Brian Voss won 19 and tied one, so he didn't lose many. That's right. That's the first ring in 10 that I can remember that Justin's left. He left some weak 10s in that opening match. Yeah, David Ozio was the guy who kept leaving the 10 pin, and uh, Justin... Uh, his entry angle, and again, I think that's the key, was the difference. And that's the reason I think Brian Voss is playing so deep in the lane. I think he likes the fact that he can get the ball well down the lane and keep it on a tight line to the pocket without crossing quite as many boards and getting it behind the head pin. Justin Romick in his fourth match of the evening. This is the first time that he's been behind Earl. It's only 10 pins, but uh, nevertheless, he's looking up now. He started the last match with a six-bagger, and that kind of really put the pressure on Ozio early. He couldn't ever catch up. Mark McDowell had a chance to go ahead of him, but didn't carry. Stabrook was never in the match. So. He is having trouble on that left-hand lane. Remember, I mentioned that the left lane tends to hook more than the right-hand lane, and the lanes will continue to go through a, a little bit of a change as oil continues to move around. And right now, Justin Romex is going to have to make some kind of a move, and maybe this is what... Uh, Brian Voss noticed that the left lane was breaking down in watching the previous match. Uh, remember, Romek did have a ball go a little bit high and then made an adjustment and didn't get it back to the pocket. Tough spare here. Makes a great cover. <coughs> Spares aren't going to beat Brian Voss, though. Not at this point, it doesn't look like it. But again, we've got a long way to go. And at least what Justin Romek has done, he's not made the big mistake and got the open. We can see... Uh, 14 national titles and a streak that he has going. He's won in eight consecutive years, but he has not won yet in 95. And the wins he's had in the last two years weren't in this country. Well, the 7-10 go down, and we can see the list here led by uh, another name. I just keep seeing that name everywhere I turn. 14 years in a row, you won a tournament. Don Johnson, 12 times. All right, great Mark Roth. All those guys are Hall of Famers, every one of them. Earl, you take any pride in that streak? Well, I, I do. As a matter of fact, I think that's, uh, that's something I can be very proud of. I only bowled 14 years on the tour, and I won every year I played, so that was kind of fun. Well, you're right. Brian is... Uh, he was doing this earlier between the second and third arrow in practice, and now he's doing it between the third and fourth arrow. It'd be kind of interesting to see what he does on this spare. Remember, there's more oil in the middle of the lane, but this lane tends to hook more, so he's going to have to be careful. What he can do, a lot of players can't do, is Brian Boss can really zip the ball in a hurry. He'll throw it real hard, real straight. You see, he's not going to hook it, but he's got to be careful. Wow. 
We're going to take a look at the previous shot. Now watch the last two pins out. And you mentioned this, Mike. The 710 was standing. Just did get him out. And then on, the, on lane 39, on three in a row, he doesn't get the seven. He just did get the ten. He could have back-to-backers there. Justin trying for his first strike. I again. Different ball, different ball reaction because he made a different release there. What he did is he opened his shoulders, tried to put more on it, and moved deeper in the lane. And the ball hooked a little earlier than he expected. And you can see he's confused. He's shaking his head a little bit. So what should he do? Well, that's a good question. I feel like Walter Ray said, you know, he was sitting here. He says, I don't know what to do unless I'm out there. And I feel kind of the same way because there is a change in the oil pattern. Tough spare here. Fit it between the two pins. Oh, nice shot. Great shot. Well, should he take a cue from Brian Boss? I, I think so. I think moving deeper is the way to go. And again, you said, uh, you know, we got a young player against an old veteran here. And the old veteran showing how smart he is. Another look at that baby split, the 310. And he does it perfectly. Just get the ball between the two pins and let the uh, ball do all the work for you. Well, right now the difference is uh, 24 pins. We're in the fifth frame. Justin Romick, one strike in this match. He's been stringing them like there was no tomorrow. Deeper, more speed. deeper and more speed. Right, Mike. More speed on the lane that hooks the most, and he moved deeper in toward the middle. Looked like he was close to the fourth arrow with that shot. Watch the big guy, the veteran, Brian Voss. All the fundamentals are right here in this one game. This guy does everything right. Look at those eyes. Never move. And it's time for Midnight Madness. Saturday, October the 14th, at the stroke of midnight. We'll kick off the college basketball season for 1995. ESPN is going to cover Maryland with Dick Vitale. Virginia with Bill Rafferty. Michigan with Larry Conley. ESPN 2 take you to Kansas with Digger Phelps. Minnesota with Michael Jordan and Clark Kellogg. And then also the Mississippi State with Dan Bonner. That's a pretty full schedule, huh, Mike? Pretty cool. Ryan Boss. Oh, like can't believe it. On that shot. He can't believe the ball reaction there. He thought he'd made a good shot. You can see his reaction at the foul line there. He just can't believe the ball hooked that hard. Remember, left, the left lane does hook more than the right lane. And it just, uh, Brian thought he made a pretty good shot there, I think. Oh. He got nine out, saves two pins and count. That's what he was saying. He was looking at the score sheet to see what the count was, and he maintains a lead in count. If he'd only got eight, the count would have been even. Yeah. Pretty interesting there. But right now, Justin, if he can double, is back in the match. No question about it. Oh! Oh, Justin says, why now? Yes. What a time for that. And watch the ball. It'll chop the five straight back. And that's what happens when you leave the solid eight. The ball just drives too hard. It doesn't, get, doesn't deflect like you'd like it to. The ball should deflect into the five, the five into the eight. He had that one written up. That was recorded in his mind. Boy, what an emotional difference. If he'd have struck there, he no could have question. taken the lead with this shot. Now he's still behind by 12 pins and has to start all over again. That's right. And, you know, when you throw the ball like that and you know it's going to be solid in the pocket, you don't look at the eight or the nine. No, you're looking at the corner. You're ten. looking at the corner. Yeah. You're looking at the corner pin. For me, the seven. For you, the ten. You're looking at, that's the one, you, if that goes down, you feel it, you got him. And that eight pin, I'm sure in Justin Romek's mind, is like it grew out of the ground. As you watch Brian, you saw Brian Boss, he's looking at the floor. He doesn't like to watch his opponent bowl. He'll just listen to the crowd, and they can tell by that reaction. He looked at her then. That wasn't as flush as the other one. Yeah, and uh, it's amazing how sometimes if the pins are just slightly off spot or if the ball just overreacts a little bit, hits too hard, doesn't hit quite hard enough as far as the rotation, gripping the lane, creating friction, all those things are what make this game what it is, difficult. Well, big shot coming up now. What does he do off of that split? Does he throw harder? Does He'll he throw move? harder. That's, uh, that's one of the first moves Brian Voss makes, and he's very good at controlling his ball speed. He will rear back a little bit and get a little more on this one because he doesn't want to get out of the playable zone. He likes the area he's playing right now, and if you move, you continue to move. Sometimes you move out of the playable area, and I think he'll just throw this one harder. He'll stay where he was. 
put a little more ball speed here and get it down the lane in a hurry. Let's see if he lofts it a little bit, gets it out in the lane. No, he didn't like something. He says, did you see that fly? Fly bothered me. Well, what he's doing here, he's talking to the tournament director, Johnny Campos, and he wants to make sure that Johnny doesn't say, hey, you over, you went past the 25-second clock. Well, that cost you 100 It cost you $100. He says, there's a bug out there. I get, I get to start over here. Here's Johnny Campos, and he's... Uh, Johnny saw the fly. He had his fly swatter wet. Ready. That's right. <laughs> All right. Let's see what he does. Looks like he moved deeper and stroked it. It does. Yeah, he sure does. He liked it. When he let it go, he liked it. 22 pins. Here's two another look big, at it. Two big shots coming up for Justin Romick. Watch him stay down with this shot and really reach out. Look at that long extension. That's what keeps the ball on line longer. Oh. And what a great shot. And he's out of the building. <laughs> he's in the starting blocks. Justin Romick has to stay with him. Doesn't. Wait a minute. <laughs> He had the domino shot going there. Well, 2-4-5, a simple conversion. The solid eight, the key shot right now. No, you're so right, Mike. He had the strike in the fifth, the solid eight in the sixth, the strike in the seventh. And I think, as you mentioned, he would have had a different frame of mind coming over to here if he'd have been on three in a row. Uh, and even no matter what boss did. Well, right now, though, he's got to put all that behind him and Put something up in the ninth frame. A strike in the ninth frame to give him an opportunity still. It's far from over. Right now, Boss going at a 217 pace, and uh, Romek can still get it out for 215. And we've seen that uh, any, any kind of a minor mistake can result in disaster, which it has all week. It only took a 207 <coughs> average to get a check here, and only 212 to make the match play, uh, the top 24. So the scores haven't been real high, and that's because a minor mistake almost always paid you the full penalty. <laughs> Uh-oh. That's trouble. Yeah. Two, four, five. Not only is, is, does he not strike here which he, when he really needs it, but it also the count. He loses three more pins in count, which makes a major difference. It gives Voss an opportunity to have a bad count and still stay ahead in the match, even though even if he doesn't, uh, even if he opened, he would still have the, the big lead. At the two, four, five. Hard and straight. <laughs> Brian Voss is probably thinking now, win it in the ninth. Strike in the ninth and good point Mike exactly yeah stay aggressive get up and make the good shot here this is the lane he likes the best he's got the best ball reaction a little it. little more hold it looks like on this lane a little more oil in the middle good concentration oh what a great arm swing. and he says the streak is still alive that's right this is uh, what nine in a row now nine, nine years, years in a row, in a row. That's an outstanding accomplishment. Against the talents on the PBA Tour. Mm -hmm. 35 pins ahead. Basically, he just <clears throat> wants to make one more good shot when he knows he's got it. And if you wonder why you haven't seen Brian win last year or the year before, two years ago he won on a nut televised event. And last year he won in Japan. So that wasn't available to the people in this country. Pointing little, at his son. A little he? thumbs up sign to Joshua. And very quickly, Justin Romek up to let me get this over with. But he had a great day. He really did. He came from the bottom down there. He was in the first match, won three big three matches against three very talented players. All right, we're finishing out right now. Brian Boss is going to finish in the 240s. Justin Romick needs to make this spare. The bowl in the 180s. Turns out it's not a close finish at all, but it's a big night for Brian Boss as he finishes out in style. He's very popular in the Detroit area. In fact, he's very popular everywhere. He's just a classy guy. Justin Romick also likes this Detroit area. The winner, Brian Boss. He bowled 245, 247. Justin Romick strikes. He'll have 187. We'll be back to talk to him. Champion, Brian Boss. Well, you kept it alive. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank Alan and Adeline. They put on a wonderful show here every every year. And uh, y'all fans come out every year and support us. And I won my first tournament here in 83. Uh, and uh, I think it's only fitting that I won here to keep my streak going. So... 
Yes. <laughs> and the, the presentation of the trophy by Alan DiBiase, the tournament chairman. Congratulations, Brian, on number 15. You deserved it. You bowled great all week. You're right. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Um, where's my son at? I was going to have him carry this trophy, but... <laughs> That's a little heavy for him. It's a little heavy, and he's only four years old, and he's a little shy, too. Well, maybe he can handle the check. We'll have Adeline give you the check. Oh, yeah, yeah. He can spend some money on some videos with that check. No doubt. Come on up, Joshua. Josh, come on up here, bud. No. Uh, okay, he's a little shy. Well, congratulations. You don't have a pocket, dude. Okay. Thanks again. We were waiting for you to finally do it here. Yeah. Congrats. Well, like I say, I, I bowl real good in this house. This, this city's a, a wonderful bowling city, and, uh, you know, I look forward to coming here every year. Well, Brian Boss is a Hall of Famer, and I'm sure a Hall of Famer over here has a question for him. Brian, is there any particular reason why you decided to start the match on the right-hand lane? Do you feel the left lane was a little different for you, maybe hooking more? Well, actually, I like both lanes. And if, if I like both lanes, I prefer to finish first. If, if I like one better than the other, then I'll choose to finish on that. But I, I like them both. How would you feel about the way Romek was going? He obviously was putting a lot of strikes together. Well, I was a little surprised at the way he opened the match out. Uh, I, you know, I expected him to throw four or five in a row at me. Uh, so, in a way, that, that kind of loosened you up a little bit. Okay, congratulations. On and a nice right. hand for Justin Thanks. Romick, who did bowl outstanding here tonight. We've got, got a look at his son right here, Mike. There we got a little guy over here to the right. Too. Uh, we have a very shy uh, young man here. Daddy here. No, he's not going to come. Well, <laughs> you cut back a little bit on your schedule lately. Uh, are you going to be bowling uh, regularly the rest of the time? Well, I had a mission this fall to win a tournament, and... Uh, Gosh, it just uh, doesn't seem like it right now. But uh, I've been away from my family for about a month, so uh, I'll probably skip a week. Well, we're going to get you back to your family, and we got to get back to our families right now. We're going to say so long from Detroit, where Brian Boss is your champion. Be sure to join us next week for the Great Lakes Classic from Grand Rapids, Michigan. We're going back to the Welsh Auditorium for the championship round finals. That's October the 18th, 7.30 Eastern Time. And stay tuned for Professional Billiards. It's the 1995 $50,000 Challenge of Champions. Semi-final match number two with Takeshi Okamura taking on Oliver Ortman, Kevin Kusek, and Alan Hopkins calling the action. Thank you.